a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this important seminar of emerging security sector leaders in Africa under the theme, Leadership in Times of Uncertainty. My name is Luca Kual. I am the Dean of Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on emerging security sector leaders in Africa. Uh, let me welcome you again as Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center, welcome you in the first session. Let me congratulate each and every one of you of your right decision to take part in this seminar. We hope by the end of this seminar, you will acquire some concepts, understanding, tools and skills, as well as exposure to new experiences that can make, that may enhance your performance as a leader. You represent many countries and institutions across the continent and with different background and wealth of experience. You are not only leaders in your own right, but the real experts of your context. And please be confident and candid in sharing your experience with your colleagues during the plenary and discussion group. Let me highlight again the objectives of this seminar. There is no doubt the COVID-19 has exposed us to a serious, the serious cracks in our system of government and capacity of state and public policies, particularly the performance of leadership. Managing uncertainty requires leadership with insight and foresight to anticipate uncertainty, but also to capitalize and use such an uncertainty to as opportunity for transformational change. The seminar is informed and guided by the concept of adaptive leadership. And this is quite essential for managing uncertainty. The article in your reading material by Ben and his colleagues uh, on five principles to guide adaptive leadership provides a good definition in terms of four A's that is forming this, work, this seminar, anticipation, articulation, adaptation, and accountability, and five core principles, evidence-based uh, learning and adaptation, testing underlying assumption and beliefs, uh, constant review of decision-making, accountability, transparency, and inclusion, and the last principle, collective action. This seminar is divided into the following four sessions. Session one, adaptive leadership, why it matters in time of uncertainty. You attended the seminar that was addressed by a distinguished guest speaker, our president, I mean, President Obosanyo. I will share with you some of the takeaway from this session. Session two is about anticipating, this is the session today, anticipating unexpected security challenges and crisis. Session three will be about responding to unexpected security challenges and crisis. And the last session will be focusing on leveraging partnership in responding to unexpected security challenges and crisis. But before I go for our conversation today, let me take away some of the key challenges, some of the key takeaway from session one about the adaptive leadership. As I mentioned, the main objective of this session of session one, and, and Kate actually mentioned it, was to examine the role and attributes of adaptive leadership in volatile and answers and an uncertain security environment and crisis. I think President Abusanyo has eloquently shared his personal experience in, in the session 
of how he applied these attributes when he was in the position of leadership at national, regional, and continental levels. Although it is difficult to summarize the wealth of experiences he shared with us in session one, here are some of key takeaways based on his experience that he shared or he did not share. But let me share some of these, these uh, key takeaways. One, anticipating needs during uncertainty. In anticipating of the challenges and crisis facing Nigeria, President Abu Sanyo convinced himself such challenges could only be addressed by a political consensus of its elites and people of Nigeria that can only be realized in a free society facilitated by a civilian democratic government. His conviction was informed by the decades of military rule uh, that had left the country heavily indebted, unstable, and poor. And this is a key, one of the key four A's, evidence or principle about evidence-based learning and adaptation. He used that principle very eloquently. The second takeaway is anticipating needs of Nigerian in, this, in the context of uncertainty. As he anticipated these challenges facing Nigeria, President Obasanjo, President Obasanjo articulated the needs of ordinary Nigerian in his new vision for Nigeria when he assumed the presidency in 1999. He articulated a vision of Nigeria, committed to a democratic governance. With it, he succeeded in transforming the army, the state institutions, and the articulation of a national security priorities to meet the needs of, of ordinary Nigerians. The third takeaway, adapting response to the needs of Nigerians or even Africa. With his new vision for Nigeria, President Abusanjo managed to meet the needs and improve the life of ordinary Nigerians by reforming the army, discouraging coups, restoring macroeconomic stability, combating rampant com corruption, by creating economic and financial crimes commission and bringing, and bringing Nigeria back into extractive industry transparency international, which improved the transparency of, of Nigeria vast oil sector. He also invested in civil service and the improvement of the technical efficiency of the government by building and deploying technocrats and managerial leaders from across the country, who improved the functioning of the bureaucracy and the state institution. President Bosanjo is said as a leader to do few things right and build on such success to do more things. And that is in terms of adapting through learning. The case of Bakasi border dispute between Nigeria and Cameroon exhibited the adaptive leadership of President Abusanjo when he adapted the award of the International Court of Justice to a consensual win and win implementation of a word of the court with the Comorian, uh, Comoron uh, leadership. The third takeaway about accountability. The example provided by President Abusanjo in addressing the insurgency in the Nile Delta by courageously listening to their grievances and concern with empathy and the way he responded to their concern, particularly the unemployment among the youth showed a quality of adaptive leadership of accountability that nurtures openness to challenges and feedback. 
the last takeaway, mobilizing collective action. The challenges facing Africa today, particularly the security challenges, are transnational and require collective action. One of the principles of adaptive leadership is to play, is to play in helping to identify shared alignment of objectives and scope for object, objective actions across, across different silos and levels of response. President Abusanjo exercised this principle through a critical mass in reforming the organization of African Union into African Union of today. These are some of the key takeaways from the year, from the year, session one. But let me go now to this session, session two. And this session is about anticipating unexpected security challenges and crisis. Before introducing the, the panelists, let me share with you the main objective of this session. The first objective, to examine how institutions and leaders anticipated trends, whether mega trends such as climate change, population growth, technolo technological innovation, migration, urbanization, and patterns that may result in dynamic changes to the security landscape in Africa. The second objective to discuss ways in which the development of national security strategy can serve as a tool to anticipate the unexpected threat and the security in, in the security sector. And third, to discuss the need for developing inclusive and centralized foresight capabilities that are guided by a proactive forward-looking approach to anticipate the unexpected security challenges and crisis in, 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 in Africa. But let me now introduce to you the panelists. We are happy today and pleased that, to, that we have a very distinguished and outstanding panelists. And these are the people who are seasoned uh, experts on security in Africa and who will help us to start conversation about how to anticipate security challenges and crisis in Africa. As you have their bios, I will highlight some few relevant aspects of their expertise and qualification. Let me start first, and I am really grateful to Dr. Muhari Maru. Dr. Muhari is currently a professor of migration policy at the School of Transnational Governance and at the European University Institute in Italy. He's also a fellow at the United Nations University Institute on Comparative Regional Integration Studies in Belgium. He holds a PhD in legal sciences from, from Gießen University in Germany and Master of Public Administration from Harvard University. And also he holds a Master of Science from the University of Oxford and Bachelor of Laws from the University of Addis Ababa. He is a member of the Technical Committee for the Tanner High Level Security Forum. He served as a program head for conflict prevention and risk analysis at the Institute for Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. He drafted the Eager Peace and Security Strategy for 2022. Dr. Muhari, you are most welcome and we are delighted having you today with us. The second, uh, the second panelist is Kamisa Kamara. She is a senior visiting expert for the Sahil at the US, National, US Institute of Peace. She has served as a Mali's Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Minister of Digital Economy and Planning, and a chief of staff to the President of Mali. She held leadership position with the National Endowment for Democracy, and she was the Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa instructor at the State Department Foreign Service Institute. She holds a Master in International Economics 
and Development from the University of uh, Green Ball Apples at, and, and a Bachelor in a, an International Relation from University of Paris. So, uh, Ms. Camisa, we are so delighted having you to give us your practical experience on the continent, especially the experience of Mali, uh, as Mali, we are seeing Mali today, how it is. Uh, let me start first with, uh, I will start first with, with Dr. Muhare. Dr. Muhare, I know you have a world of experience and uh, I want to start with you first to share with the participants some of the key mega trends or one mega trends that you believe will, will impact the development and security in Africa over the next five to 10 years? And what are the likely implications for the security landscape for which security sector leaders as the participants are standing today should be preparing? And can you share with the participants the challenges for anticipating such challenges? Dr. Mohari, you are most welcome. Good, good day to all of you. And uh, thank you, Luca, for uh, the kind introductions. And also thank you for the Africa Center colleagues for having me uh, in this program. Um, let me start. You have asked the, the issue of uh, mega trends. Um, uh, by definition, mega trends uh, are factors uh, or driving forces that have uh, great influence um, currently, but even greater impact in the future. And those factors, I would like to mention a few of them, uh, but I will concentrate on one, how it relates to the others. We know demography, mobility or migration, urbanization, climate change, and technology are critical factors that will drive many of the changes that we see. Uh, there might be other additional factors, but I just wanted to mention this and see how this influences governance and indirectly also and directly security governance. Uh, if we talk about uh, some of the factors, you know, uh, demography, it has been uh, emphasized it several times. The African Union at some point had its summit on specifically on demography use, especially use unemployment. And the fact that the population grows at 2.8% growth rate and the workforce that is growing at 3.3% uh, uh, provi provides an asset for the continent to grow. But this asset could be also a liability uh, if it's not governed very well. Uh, it could be a young population that is restless, mobile, uh, conversant, highly connected, and demanding. And this could affect the overall stability of uh, African countries. And one of the aspects of this young continent, Africa, young, uh, population is increased migration. And uh, migration uh, defined either as mobility, which is greener, good uh, for many integrative, as integrative opportunity or force, or it could be displacement as a result of being compelled to leave one's residence or habitual resident, uh, habitual um, uh, uh, house or resident, uh, resident in a country. Now, displacement in many ways is an indicator of state, uh, vulnerability of state failure. Uh, if you see uh, conflicts that we have, or if you see the number of IDPs a country has, then it could be indicator of the vulnerability of the state uh, for state failure. Currently, we see Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, um, Somalia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and others that have high or large number of internal displacement 
uh, indicative of the inherent problems of the state to govern their population and uh, to avoid or at least prevent, predict, prevent, and respond and necessarily adapt to uh, the causes of displacement, usually, which are uh, conflict. And you have more than 25 million uh, IDPs in the continent. And this is three times of the number of refugees. If uh, uh, in some cases it could be a little bit less, but from year to year, it's al al almost three times. And that is uh, indicative of that people are seeking uh, flights or safety within a country, but also most of the conflicts are localized. Uh, so you have uh, many kids in this regard, Nigeria, Ethiopia and DRC. Um, also, the internal mobility has increased significantly uh, within Africa. And uh, we know that uh, it has increased by 7.5% every year, uh, almost uh, to, uh, to a level where internal Africa's internal migration is much more important as a driver of change than anything else, uh, especially uh, middle towns, uh, middle level towns are increasing and expanding uh, with the trend of decentralization and devolution that is happening in many countries. Middle towns are growing fast. Uh, you have also um, from 13 million in 2008, now almost 26 million in 2019, you have increased number of mobility in the continent. And for that reason, you have uh, these initiatives of free movement regimes uh, as part of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, that is being promoted. And that takes me to second point, uh, if you allow me, Luca, to focus on border governance and border security with increased movement, not only internally, in terms of predicting, preventing, and responding to conflicts and factors that are a cause of displacement, internal displacement or external displacement as refugees. But even more, in terms of disting uh, distinguishing or differentiating between bad mobility and good mobility across borders. And that is about capability. Uh, on the one hand, there is a need to facilitate movement. So facilitation is an important function of the state in border areas but also protection for those mobile and protection for the host or the transit areas becomes important. So facilitation and protection has to be balanced and ensured at the same time. And the only factor that distincts between facilitation and protection is the capability to differentiate between uh, what one may call bad and good mobility. And these are about pandemic, uh, it could be about pandemic, ensuring that uh, infection rates are uh, kept at lower level, there are screening and so on and so on, as we have seen it, or it could be about threats of other kind of hard security threats from terrorist, terrorism to um, uh, trafficking in human beings or trafficking of drugs, small arms proliferation and so and so on. We know the borders in Africa has been considered as frontiers an end of a jurisdiction and the beginning of a new one. And uh, uh, for a long time were considered at least by policymakers at the center as no man's land. But this is not the case. One of the trends we see is borders and borderlands, border populations are certainly has become economically important, central with exploration and exploitation of natural resources, whether we like it or not factually, most border most of the resources, especially oil, uh, are located in border areas. We can mention many names and cases in the continent. And that calls for a more robust uh, uh, border governance where uh, border areas are not anymore economically, not only economically periphery, but also politically they are becoming a center stage. So this relates to the border governance in general. And the issue of urbanization also becomes an important element with movement of population. We have mega cities, especially those in 
coastal areas which will be impacted by climate change. You have mega city governance, urban governance, powerful emergence of powerful mayors in politics and increasing delivery protests, delivery of services to the population. Mm, okay. And yeah, so this, let me just finish by saying this one, ungovernable urban areas and urban warfare, uh, warfare may increase uh, in the future, which is a big challenge, but related to mobility, urbanization and uh, governance in general. I'll come back later if uh, time permits on the other factors. Thank you, Luca. Excellent, Mohari. I think you, you painted a very important, yeah, I mean, you pick a very important uh, uh, mega train elements, the population mobility. And what I like also from your, your, your analysis is how you link it to other mega trends, whether it is urbanization, I mean, demographic changes, or even the climate change. And the implication of this one to the, the challenges for the border security. And this we highlighted very well within the context of the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I think the whole lot of commitment for the, for the free mobility, especially when you talk about the nomadic um, um, uh, uh, group. But really the real question is based on your, the way you painted the, the mega trend for the next five to 10 years, and the implications of the border. The real question, do you think really the African state really need land forces or the armies to, for the kinds of challenges that you have um, eloquently um, uh, analyzed that could be anticipated in the next five to 10 years? Or will, will other types of institution be needed more to provide for the citizen and national security? So what is really the, the implication for the institutional security infrastructure? Uh, do we need the same structure that we are seeing today on the continent? Or do we need to change in order to cope with these security challenges what, that we are going to see in the next five to 10 years? That is very important question. And I think we can look at it from two, um, through two lenses. One is, uh, an, imminent, an immediate one is to see indeed what are the most pre prevalent security threats and challenges that we are talking in this mega trend. And indeed, if what kind of instruments are necessary to govern those security uh, arrangements, the security sector should be equipped with. And in my opinion, that's the, the first one. And that goes to the heart of the cause, the root cause approach, especially. Uh, when it comes to these mega trends, which you cannot address them uh, by only having uh, addressing, uh, by having strong military, expeditionary military system, traditional ones and so on, which doesn't work. For example, I mentioned um, in the first category that urban warfare um, uh, and also urban governance will be much, much more, more important. And there will be places where urban uh, uh, parts of urban setting uh, are going to be difficult to govern. And also in the border areas that uh, once considered peripheries, uh, the engagement is increasing and there is a need for uh, more work. So, uh, for example, in border areas, you may need more transnational governance than security governance by one nation. And with the increasing mega trends that I have mentioned, increasing trade, for example increasing mobility and so on. What you need is actually more engagement, more capability that is transnational between countries or transboundary and less of national response, including with the pandemic that you mentioned, one of the loopholes or shortcomings we have seen is governments that were internally capable of, I mean, well ready, ready in terms of their governance have responded better than others but also those who have cooperation on border areas had done better than others. Uh, so the first one is the kind of the type of security threats that we are facing should dictate, determine what kind of armies, whether we have to have armies, whether we have to have what kind of security sector we should have. So it's the need, the demand, the strategic direction, which should determine what kind of institutions we should, we should have and increasingly, the mega trends show that not the kind of armies 
the security sector we had before. So a, a paradigm shift, uh, reinventing the system, and more importantly, resilience, uh, resilient systems within the security system that could be adapted to many aspects would be important. And for this, the second aspect, not only this, uh, this arrangement from, from uh, what is needed to, uh, to determine the security sector's uh, posture, but the second one is effectiveness also. Uh, what is effective is very important. It's not simply because uh, this is demanded, but the effectiveness will determine. In this regard, I would say along the lines that you have mentioned, uh, still we need more uh, work on the predictive capability, uh, uh, early warning and so on. But even more, more than that, because there are developments in that regard in the past one decade, at African Union level, Rex level, at national level, early warning has been in, uh, provided. But still with early warning, we are not able to respond early. And this related to the culture of the leadership in institutions, organizations, and also states themselves, the nature of the state. They are not yet fu fully changed to respond effectively. And that is where we need a lot of work the responsive capability, but also the preventive capability, which is that comes with part of the capability of the state has to be uh, improved in addition to the predictive and responsive, which is most of the time the security sector comes, but the preventive aspect on the soft uh, security, insecurity causes has to be also uh, enhanced. And last, the adaptive capability where we cannot change many of the things, but there are a need to change in the culture, organization uh, of the society, the state and security sector specifically. There is a need to adapt to situation which we cannot change fully. And this okay. relates to many of the issues that I mentioned earlier, um, Luca. Okay. Excellent. Um, maybe Mohare, before Mohare, let me, you, you articulate very well anticipating this these mega trends that we know are going to come, the implication and you zoom in to the, uh, the, the border security you really, really articulated on the law, on the issues of uh, the mobility. I see we're coming to the whole thing about it is you expressing yourself and the way you articulate, but we want to, to make it to institutionalize. How can we be able to anticipate these mega trends and the, and the security implication? And this is bringing us to the issues of the importance of security governance. And in particular, to what level do you think a development of a national security strategy or even sectorial security strategy like defense could be a good way for African countries to anticipate in a reasonable way to the, the, the security challenges and, 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 and crisis. And in fact, I want to highlight, and it would be good if you can zoom in the issue of uh, the foresight and analytical capacity. I think you talk about the early warning system. What could be done differently during the national security strategy development or security strategy to build this capacity to anticipate the security challenges in the future? And the, and the security implication. Because that could be a good way of how African to institutionalize the capacity at the national level, at the regional level, at the continent level to anticipate these challenges and the mega train and within a coherent grand strategy that can be you able to be accurate to predict and to prepare yourself for this mega train. What do you think would be, I think you mentioned the issue of early warning system what could be done? Do you think the national security strategy and how could it be done in such a way to anticipate the, the security challenges and the mega threat, to anticipate the, the mega threats? Yeah. No, I think that's, that's a very important question. And I think you have highlighted in your introductory remark one aspect of the need to adapt to situation, adapt to the threats and so on. The first I would say, and there are three uh, points that I want to raise here. The first I would say is increasing the previous uh, policy posture we had in African countries is threat-based. It is most of the time, it focus on threats. Uh, threats are very, it's important to focus on threats, 
but we have to look at opportunities too. The security policies uh, has to focus on, on the opportunities also for two reasons. One, the mega trends, the mega factors, the driving forces do not come as a threats only. They come as opportunities too. Like I say, demography or technology, both of them, they come as enabler of uh, uh, negative forces or enablers of response by the peace and security actors, if you wish. Uh, if we say technology, for example, uh, it's a big mega, mega trend setter. Uh, we have uh, many cyber warfare, cyber security threats and so on, but also uh, the cyberspace has contributed significantly for the growth and human security of population. Uh, issues of drone warfare that is coming as important. Uh, this change in command, control, and communication, it has enabled both negative forces and positive forces. So to the most important aspect, the first point I want to make is that there is a need to adapt fast. But how can that happen? One of the challenges, and then my second point, is the culture, organizational culture, in the security sector in Africa, it is still traditional, extremely regressive, if you wish. It's not progressive, not, not yet progressive, fully other culture. There are here and there bits of efforts, but culture is a system, a normative framework, an institutional framework, and above all, the collaborative framework. You have a norm setting that has gone very well in Africa. From African Union, RECs, and member states, they have been engaged on policy formulation and so on that take human security into consideration, but not fully. It's not, it's not really internalized. One indicator to show the, inter the lack of internalization is how much budget do they, up, for example, security sector apportion or allocate for predictive capability, predictive analysis, compared to responsive. No, you know, if you look at the predictive, the preventive aspect, they get peanut, if you wish, compared to the other, the responsive capability of the armed forces, for example, within the armed forces in countries or other security sector, we know. So there is, that is a tradition, the focus on more armament, more capability in terms of response, and that is a result of threat-based analysis of the, on, or firming or, or anchoring the security system, security policy of national defense and security policy on threats. Uh, that has to change drastically. More resource, more focus, more le leadership and time, but also budgetary allocation has to go to the predictive and uh, preventive systems. And that will need also the third element, leadership. The leadership, mm -hmm. again, is a result of institutions and society. Uh, it doesn't exist in vacuum. Leadership in security sector, leadership in politics, political sphere are a result of the society, uh, a result of mobilization of social forces, economic forces, political forces, and the change in that system will have to come. So it's, uh, to change the security sector, probably the most effective place to start is the overall view of security sector in the society itself and the forces, the social, economic, and political forces. And that needs to be changed drastically as a matter of uh, uh, culture. But uh, uh, the, it has to start with policy initiatives like the African Center has been doing for some time to start with the process of dialogue and discussion on those core issues. And those processes could lead to a good product, not only in terms of document, but changing and setting uh, the thinking within the society. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohari. The, the last question may be, just briefly, you said very well, the issue of leadership, the issue of institutions, but the institutions that take a longer time in order to, us, to respond to these uh, mega trends and the security challenges facing Africa. But maybe can you highlight in, in line of issue what you mentioned about the leadership and in terms of adaptive leadership, what type of leadership that you need in order to respond and then to anticipate these security challenges 
Yeah. And here we are talking about whether it's in terms of anticipation, articulation, or adaptation or accountability. Yeah. The relevance of these the adaptive leadership in the issues of anticipation of the security challenges and, and crisis. In the context also of leadership and as well as the institution, maybe briefly in about four, one minute, please. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I think um, the one of the challenges that we have been talking for a long time now is uh, uh, how do you change, for example, early warning to early response? And why do we have problems of early response in many of the conflicts that we have at uh, national level, uh, uh, Rex level, and African Union level, even globally? And there are many factors to it uh, that are important and probably uh, addressing those will be difficult uh, only by addressing one factor. But I want to take one factor out. Uh, again, this, is go this goes to uh, the leadership, uh, leadership um, uh, role of the leadership in ensuring that um, scientific work on predictive analysis that are being conducted in different institutions are going to uh, are, are translating them to response, uh, effective response, early response on the ground. And we are seeing it within African uh, Union, um, a, a serious problem with the African Union, for example, um, the, the conflict in Ethiopia, in many parts of Ethiopia, the issue of Chad um, and Mali, uh, and uh, other places in Western African countries, Sahel, Southern Africa, Mozambique, and others that need transnational response, if you wish, continental response or regional response, uh, regardless of the presence of very well studied predictive analysis that has been provided on what should be done, uh, the leadership has failed to respond to this effectively. And this has to do with the culture. Uh, look, the, I tend to see the peace and security actors in Africa in three layers. You have the technical level, expertise level, peace and security experts and so on. And then you have the diplomatic level, which also deals at Rex African Union level, uh, which discusses these issues and the need for response at peace and security council level, for example, at the African Union or other layers at Rex uh, or ECOWAS and so on. Then you have also the political policy level. Most often you would find that the technical community, the technical expertise, civil society and so on, they agree on what will happen more or less in general in a crisis situation. They have the predictive capability, no, though not highly refined, but sufficient adequate for action, for response. And then they agree with the diplomatic community, with the peace and security councils, with the summits and so on, some of the, uh, sorry, the councils that we have uh, at diplomatic level. The, so the technical and the diplomatic, most often they see each other eye to eye. Now, from the diplomatic up to the political and policy level, there is a big gap. The diplomatic community most often has a culture not to pass the real, assessment early warnings as they are. So the culture is to filter them so much so that it's, it's, it is adjusted for the leadership or not to put the leadership in a very bad spot. Uh, we have seen this one. Early warnings were there on Ethiopia for some time now. Uh, there were early warning in, uh, on the Mozambique crisis that we have, Sahel and West Africa in most of the case. Now, the leadership ignores those or underplays those until they become too difficult to reverse them. And they, it will be about uh, pro, uh, reactive response or adaptation uh, to the situation that exists. And it's a reversal of all. Look at APSA. It was meant to provide solutions to the current crisis we see in Ethiopia or in uh, uh, Mali and in Mozambique. Uh, look at ACRIC. Where is ACRIC, for example, the African capability for rapid response, nowhere to be seen. Uh, the African standby force, uh, is it still standing? Is it sitting? Is it sleeping? It's a big question. 
one has to ask, where are we in that regard? A lot has been invested on this normative thinking of policy shift that has to be made uh, and a cultural shift that has to be made, but none has materialized. In my opinion, it is about the lack of adaptive leadership to make sure that mandates are effectively used by different actors, African Union, RECs, and at, at national level also different mandates, but still we are paralyzed by that culture, political culture of uh, uh, pleasing political leaders and policymakers. Uh, and that is where we are having a challenge uh, in terms of changing uh, the different governance systems. We have security governance, one of them. Excellent. Moharis, thank you very much. I think you, you, you really nail it down to the issue of leadership and whether you can be able to engineer uh, a adaptive leadership uh, within the context of a, a good governance in the security sector. Really, thank you very much. We'll have a follow-up questions. And for the participants, uh, please prefer your question to Dr. Mohari as we move to the second panelist. You can, you can, you can type in your question directly or you can ask them question directly, but we encourage you to ask question directly. Please prepare your question for him. Uh, let, let us move now to uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Kamisa uh, Kamara. Uh, Kamisa, we are so happy having you. You are somebody having a first-hand information practically with your experience in Mali. And I would like really to share with the participants some of your experience in, 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 in Mali. And Mali is becoming a big issue now on the continent. Uh, we know cognizant of that, we want just only to reflect, for if you can be able to reflect on your personal experience, the way, what you shared during the time you are in the government. So, so based really, really Camisa, based on your personal experience as a senior Malian government official, what do you see as key security challenges, whether known or unexpected? that might face the region, especially the West Africa, in the next five, five to 10 years. And in particular, based on your experience, what challenges do you think, and based on your experience of Malian experience, the government may face to anticipate and to prepare for these sorts of challenges ahead? Uh, you are welcome, uh, uh, Kamisa. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. And uh, thank you to ACSS for putting this uh, very important seminar together. And I would also like to thank my co-panelists for, um, I guess, laying the groundwork for me to uh, comment on uh, what he just said and also giving you my take on the mega trends on the continent. And also on um, also giving my personal opinion on how difficult it is uh, nowadays to be in an African government. Um, I am going to have to slightly uh, defer and disagree with what my um, uh, Dr. Muhari said uh, earlier about uh, the culture of leadership preventing um, governments to act early. I think we have to be cognizant of the amount of pressure that African governments are currently under. It's not enough to be able to uh, foresee or forecast uh, trends, uh, to foresee or for forecast some of the challenges that those governments are going to be, to be facing. It's also another thing to have the necessary means, the human resources, the financial resources, and also the political momentum to be able to tackle those. And very rarely those two align when you're in government. And so it makes it an almost impossible task to um, raise to the expectations that the population have of you as a government official, that uh, the youth have uh, of you, but also um, that the international community has of you as, as a, a government. And so um, I, I would say that it's very, 
it, it's more complicated than a culture of leadership or uh, governments not being uh, willing to face um, the, the trends that we, uh, we have laid out uh, since the beginning of uh, this discussion. I would like to maybe highlight um, one mega trend that Dr. Muhari mentioned earlier um, in passing, which is the demographic explosion in, in, on the African continent. I think it's maybe one of the biggest ones that we are currently facing and that we will be facing within the next 20 to 30 years. By 2050, one in four inhabitants of the world's population will be African. Um, the African continent, uh, to put it lightly, is a demographic time bomb. For example, as of today, the population of the Sahel region is about uh, 90 million inhabitants. And the forecast shows that the number of inhabitants in the Sahel region, which is the, the region I, I know best um, on the African continent, will more than double in 2050, which is only 30 years uh, away, to reach close to 200 million inhabitants. And so there is a real urgency to draw the consequences of such demographic explosion because there will just not be enough resources uh, for everyone. And again, 2050 is only uh, 30 years away. And so the demographic explosion implies that whatever investment has been made until now in terms of uh, health infrastructure, uh, number of schools, um, urbanization, uh, cities, cities, transportation, etc. This investment will need to at least be doubled, and that's you know very simple math. And so, with different volumes, each country on the African continent can follows a similar trend that what we're seeing in in the Sahel region. In Nigeria, is by far the most eloquent example um, uh, of this. By 2050, the country will have. 401 million inhabitants, becoming the third populous country in the world after India and China. Underlying this exponential demography are the many development challenges that are quite worrying. The second characteristic of this demographic explosion, and Dr. Muhari uh, mentioned it, um, is the, the youthfulness of the African population. 50% are under 15 years of age. And it is perceived as both an economic force and a danger, mostly given the structural deficits in um, public and uh, security services. And so what is the big question here? Um, what links can we establish between the deterioration in security and the demographic explosion? For the security crisis, especially in the Sahel region, the demographic parameter must be conceived as an amplifying element that acts both on the roots of um, the, the security situation and the, and the conflict and on its consequences. The G5 Sahel countries, which are um, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Chad, and Mauritania, um, were experiencing structural and security vulnerabilities prior to this issue of population explosion. And the phenomenon only reinforces the disruptions and dysfunctions of the systems. And another question that I would like to, to ask all of us here, do we believe that countries and states are ready to face this demographic explosion? You know, most countries of the G5 Sahel devote over 30% of their national budgets to defense and security at the expense of critical areas such as education, health, um, job creation, food security, etc., which are, you would think, essential to face this. And this is what we all, I guess, need to get ready for. Um, and I believe it's only going to get um, tougher and uh, tougher on the continent. Maybe, um, Luca, if you, if you allow me, I would like to talk about the, the question of national security and the need for um, a, a national security strategy in, um, in, in African countries. So first, um, 
you know, let's be reminded that national security is the requirement uh, to maintain the survival of a state or of a country through the use of um, economic power, political power, power projection and diplomacy. The concept was uh, developed in the United States after World War II. And so a national security strategy does generally identify and prioritize the most important interests of a country, the threats to those interests and the objectives that the country must pursue to secure those interests. So if we look at it this way, no state or no country can actually do without a national security strategy. And we can believe or assume that, you know, this strategy is created one way or another. In Francophone um, Africa, we call it sometimes uh, politique générale. And the prime minister usually carries that strategy and presents it to the National Assembly in what we call Déclaration de politique générale, or DPG. And what varies from one country to another is how holistically this strategy is adopted by the different state institutions and how well it is understood and absorbed by the different states institution. And I believe it's really the job of a president and the presidency as an institution to make sure that the national security strategy is understood and followed. But again, I believe that no state can actually do without. And uh, quickly to, to wrap up my, my, my uh, different arguments here, you know, forecasting is, is important, it is crucial, especially for um, weak states on the African continent. But let's keep in mind that getting ready for um, the trends that we're going to be seeing in the next 10, 20 to 30 years will require much more than just a change in, in culture or leadership. It, um, it will require a lot of resources, but also an alignment of interests and actions throughout um, state institutions, but also politicians and civil society leaders. And honestly, after having served in government for almost three years, I would be, uh, I, don't, I don't think that I can give you a clear outline of how this can happen. I know how difficult it can, it, can, it can be to do this. I know how not doing this can actually lead to a coup. Um, and what I would like for all of us to understand is that state capabilities currently on the African continent are not ready to face the mega trends that we have been talking about since the beginning of this, of this discussion. And maybe I'm not answering the question or I'm not giving you the answer that you would like to hear, but it, it, to me, it's almost impossible as of today for African states with the structural deficiencies with their lack of resources, uh, be it financial, human, and with the international pressure to face the trends that we have been talking about. So I'm looking forward to discussing this further with you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah excellent, Camisa. I think you, you uh, yeah, first, thank you very much for identifying the uh, demographic change as a key challenges. I think it's linked to what, uh, what Muhari said. And I thank you also for identifying this. So, security, I mean, a policy or a strategy is absolutely very important. Um, uh, and, and I think for, for the survival of a state, I think it's very important, despite of all these challenges, as you said, these are transnational, uh, transnational challenges that need collective action and regional action. It's not only the country alone, but I think there's uh, that resources in the continent that could be able to be mobilized if we have a very good direction of how you can utilize them effectively, you said it very well, 
if the spending is going to the uh, to the defense, I think we can do better by realigning the resources in such a way to meet this mega trend. But let me let me move, and I think that so, so you really articulate very well some of the challenges. Um, but it's just a matter of how can we be doing differently. If we have a very good um, a grand strategy that can help us, how can we efficiently be able to do to use our resources? But let me let me just ask a very a very big a, a very fundamental question based on your personal experience. What are some of the key elements of adaptive leadership, whether it is in anticipation, articulation, adaptation, or accountability, that you found personally so useful during your time as a senior government official? And, 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 and what are some of the insights that you would like to share with the, uh, with the participant today? Yes. Uh, so, so to prepare them, uh, to how can they can be able to anticipate the, the security challenges and and crisis facing the, the continent. Mm -hmm. You can briefly just in a part four four yeah. minutes that, that you share that one. Sure. So I have to say that in my different positions, um, I was very close to the ministers of defense and security because they were great people, of course, but I I had a feeling that they always had solutions for every single problem that I was facing. I was, before I became foreign minister, I was foreign policy advisor to the president. And then I became foreign minister. And then I became minister of digital economy. And then I was chief of staff to the president. But I have to tell you that every time I run into a big issue that I didn't know how to deal with, um, either my colleague who was Minister of Defense or my colleague who was Minister of Security or um, the military chief of staff to the president always would come up with um, a way of looking at things or a solution that I hadn't thought about. And that, that is my personal experience. Um, second thing that I would like to share with you is that I, so, you know, Mali, as you know, is a country that depends a lot on international assistance when it comes to um, uh, security sector uh, reform, when it comes to military training. And so as a foreign minister, none of the international missions that I, that I took didn't include the Minister of Defense. We were like twin brothers and sisters. We were always traveling together because no developmental issues um, of Mali or of any of the Sahel countries could be discussed without um, a security aspect to it. And so my word for you and to you is that, you know, as security sector leader, you, you may have more power than you can even imagine. You know, as a, as a citizen, you can always challenge a politician you can always challenge a government official. You can even challenge a president, but it is very difficult to challenge a security, a security leader who knows what he or she is talking about because we all know that our survival depends on you. And so adaptive leadership means a lot of things when it comes to security. But one thought is that security involves so many sectors of society that I believe security sector leaders are really experts in everything. And so, you know, the most successful security sector leaders that I've worked with, and you don't have to be minister of defense or security to be a security sector leader. In your personal field and the personal initiatives that you will, you will take, you know, um, I guess you need to be able to reach out and understand actually the links between security and justice and security and economy and security and, and foreign affairs. And the most successful security sector leaders I've worked with had a very good working relationship with you know, the diplomatic corps, the different embassies, et cetera, because again, they did understand the very easy and logical connections uh, between the security sector reforms and all other sectors of society. So to me, adaptive leadership when it comes to security sector 
means being able to reach beyond um, the security sector and being able to connect the dots between security and all other sectors of, of governments, of society. And again, you as security sector leaders have a lot to say in how your countries are governed and what you, you see as, as trends and people in government will listen to you. Um, you just have to, I guess, make the first, um, make the first step. Oh, Camisa, excellent. That's a very good point that you said. I mean, I think what you have highlighted, especially for the participant, that security is within the human security. And it is, and how they secure the participant today, they are leaders of their own, and they can have a space to, to, to bring change and have an open mind and attitude that they should look to the, not their side or the traditional looking to the security, and they can make a lot of difference. I think that's a very, a very important point. I think the last, the last question, uh, Kamisa, is just a base, yes again, is based on your experience. Uh, what, what would the security leaders of today as they are actually attending meeting today, what they could do in order to anticipate the future challenges and crisis? Some of the things that they should do, uh, they, 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 they should be doing to anticipate they, they, I know you highlighted the issue of resources. I know you have highlighted the issue of capabilities, but exactly this is the point that what can we do differently now in order to help this, the capability of these security leaders to anticipate the security challenges and crisis. Just briefly, we can just be just three to three minutes or four minutes. Yeah. Sure. That's so, you know, as, as security leaders, you're not, you're not researchers. Um, so, I mean, you, you can see um, events happening on the ground or um, some, some trends, but th th that would be your personal assessment. So you're not a researcher, so I don't think that you, you, you'll be able to, you're not researchers, sorry. And so you're not going able to just, you know, being able to, you know, forecast what is happening in the future. But most of our countries do have um, think tanks that are either embedded with uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was the case, uh, which is the case in, in Mali, or the Ministry of Defense, or um, there are also, you know, NGOs who have um, research capabilities and, and do produce reports. The unfortunate situations that we face sometimes is that those reports are not, are well read, well, sorry, are well-read outside of your countries, but not, not inside. And I would urge you to, you know, get closer to the, those think tanks. They, you know, sometimes have, you know, hidden gems that, you know, you might have not have thought about. Um, and so there is always a way to uh, promote collaboration between security forces and uh, those think tanks, and they might be interested in your experience, but it would be also useful for you to hear well the trends that they have um, um, forecast in, um, uh, in in your respective countries or in your region. And I would like to add that you know sometimes national leaderships, your national leaderships might be. Um, reticent to have a national security uh, strategy, but they, they do need to understand that in order to survive, they cannot do without foresight. And uh, you might be the catalyst for that to happen. And so there's just no way around foresight these days. And if you don't have a strategy, then you get sucked in the not so important, not urgent operational demands of the day. And this is just not how you run a country. And so I believe that security sector leaders have a, or will have as the years go by an increasingly uh, important role to play in the way uh, their countries are governed. And I'm not advocating for coups here. What I am saying is that you as security sector leaders should be the, um, uh, the main partners of uh, the people who are in charge in order to um, 
give them you know advice uh, informed advice and again do not forget that you you have in your countries think tanks who have already thought about uh, the future and have done the research and so the research is usually there already it just need to be unearthed and um, I think that is your job as a security sector leader. Oh, oh, Kamisa, thank you very much. You know, one of the principles for the deputy leadership is evidence-based. And I think the point you made is really very important. We do have, let us start what we have, especially the issue of think tanks. But even what you say, the issue of foresight and capability to predict and to see is actually, it is indispensable. And it is very important within the overarching national security strategy. And I think what you said also, these leaders, you have a space for you to change things gradually. It's not, not, not in a very big way, but gradually. And these leaders, they will be listening to you. And I think this is a very important message that you are sending. So the message is very clear. You are leaders of your own. Research is very important. One of the principles of adaptive leadership is evidence-driven. And I think because it's not about talking, it's about how can the evidence you have, you'll be able to inform the process. And I mean, to challenge or I mean to help your 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 bosses to, to 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 see the evidence and the research. I think I think thank you very much, uh, Kamisa, for your your yeah. Thank, thank you very much for your insight. And uh, Mohari and Kamisa, thank you very much.